Welcome to Cedar Fort Publishing and Media Behind the Scenes. I'm Valerie Loveless and I'll be your host today. And today I have with me Sean Pollock, author of The Road to Freedom. Welcome, Sean. Thank you. Glad to be here. Glad to have you as well. So let's get started. Uh, tell me about your book. T- let our listeners know what your book is about. Okay. My book is called The Road to Freedom. It is historical fiction. It's um, set in World War II, and it's about two soldiers. They're um, two German soldiers fighting for the German army, and this is in the final days of World War II when the Russians were moving um, west at a very rapid pace, moving on Berlin. And these two soldiers in my book, they are overrun by the Russians and trapped behind enemy lines, and they know that's a really bad situation for them, so they are trying to find a way around the Russian line to get to the American line, which is their only hope for survival. Um, one, of these, one of these soldiers is a very battle-hardened captain, and the other one is a very young, naive, scared private who is a Latter-day Saint. So each has something to learn from the other as they try to, as they try to get to the American side. It's a pretty interesting, unique book. Um, what inspired this book? It was inspired partly because I've always been a big World War II buff. I like writing about um, the different different aspects of the military and of war, reading about those things. The way this specific story came about was it started with an idea that my dad had. He's also a big um, history buff. And he wrote up kind of a treatment of the um, basic story, a few chapters of it, and he gave them to me and said, you can, you can take this and shape it any way you want. And I did. He gave me the beginning of it. I changed a few things. From that point on, I developed the story as I went. Your whole family is into history. How did that play into your life as a child? What was that like? There were always a lot of books around the house, a lot of um, books mostly about World War II. My dad had a set that I read quite a lot when I was was growing up. Um, My grandparents also had a lot of history books. Both of my grandfathers are veterans of World War II. So we knew that about them, and there were, like I said, a lot of books and movies and different things always just going on as I was a kid. Um, yeah. What is it? My dad is really interested in the wars as well. What is it about wars that's so interesting to men? Like, what, what is the draw to learning about wars? I mean, besides the obvious that, you know, it's important to know our history and how they started in the first place. It, it's kind of a paradox, isn't it? War is war is horrible. War is ugly. War is probably the worst state of humanity that you could ever hope to find because anything bad that a person will do will happen during a war. But at the same time, I think a lot of a lot of people um, see war as kind of a challenge. You know, could I handle it? Could I survive that? Could I be part of this thing and and come out on the other side? And then, of course, when you look back on something like World War II, I think the prevailing attitude was, well, there's a job that we need to get done because the Nazis are taking over the world and the Japanese are taking over the world and committing all these atrocities, and we have to stop them. That was really something, I think, that was a motivator for that generation. And we look back on it now and see, yeah, that was something that they had to do. And maybe uh, every war that's come after that, um, try to couch it in those same terms. I mean, the Americans tried to stay out of the war as long as they could, didn't they? They did. I mean, I think for a long time they, they looked at it the same way they looked at World War One. This is a European war. This is dealing with um, issues that have nothing to do with us, which changed, of course, when Japan bombed Pearl Harbor. Mm-hmm. And then that brought us into the fight in the Pacific. And because Japan and um, Germany were allies, that brought us in on the uh, European theater as well. So you were well-versed with the wars and everything, but did you have to do any additional research to do this book? Because you go into more than just what happened in the war. There's a lot of background about the characters and what their lives were like before. Right. Because the characters are German, and that's um, something that I don't have any cultural background in, of course I had to study up on um, German life during that time period. I had to uh, learn more about the German army. Obviously, coming from an American perspective, I know a lot more about what it was like for an American fighting man. I had to learn more about what it was like for the German side. And that got into some pretty interesting things, because when you think World War II and you think Germany, you think Nazis. But then, of course, there were a lot of Germans who fought for their country who hated the Nazis. And 
didn't want Hitler running their country any more than they wanted to lose to the Americans or the Russians. So it got into some pretty multifaceted um, things there, and it was very fascinating. Yeah, well, I, I knew a little bit of the history of of the war, but I didn't know the prehistory, which I learned in your book a little bit more about that there were the Russians who were communists, right? And then, right. and that's what the Social Party was supposedly fighting against, right? The Nazi Socialist Party. So that was really interesting. And then what was the other... Um, what was the other ones that they were trying to fight against, the, the Nazis? In, before the war, when the, they were... They were trying to keep the Russians out, and then who was the other ones they were trying to keep out? Um, the Americans and the British were coming in after, after they had landed mm -hmm. at Normandy. They were coming in from the west. The Russians were coming in from the east. Americans also came up Italy. Um, I believe that was it mm -hmm. as far as the war goes. So what would, in your understanding, what would make these people do the things they did? And I think you also made it pretty clear in your book that a lot of the army, the Nazi army, was like not the same as the party, right? Like the SS and, and the party. They were more like the normal people who were um, enlisted and had to fight, but there were the, the evil guys are at the top. Those are the ones where everyone looks back at history, right, and goes, oh, my gosh, how could they have done those things, right? Right. You had, um, yeah, you had the regular army, the Wehrmacht, and that was ordinary citizens who, who fought in the, you know, who fought for Germany. And then you had the members of the Nazi party, and their, their military arm was the Waffen-SS, and they were, I think, given a little more priority as far as funding and equipment and training goes. And they were, they were the mean ones. I mean, it's not to say the Wehrmacht never got up to anything that they shouldn't have as far as human rights abuses go. I think every army and every war mm -hmm. has some black spot on them there. But the Waffen-SS, they were, they were the worst of the worst, I think. Yeah, I, I heard somewhere, and I don't know if this is true at all, but they would specifically choose, like, the most deranged psychopaths to be the the leaders of the SS, which is scary, and would explain why they did such horrible things. There was um, there was one battalion called the Deerlevanger Battalion that was specifically a penal battalion. If if you were too crazy or too criminal to be a part of a regular fighting unit, you got put into this unit, and they yeah atrocity was pretty much their stock in trade. Mm -hmm. They just rampaged through the eastern. Um, through Eastern Europe committing atrocities, and that, that's probably, like you say, that, you know, if you talk about psychopaths yeah. and atrocities, that's, um, you know, that's patient zero, I guess, if you want to call it, that, that battalion there. How did you end up getting this book published? How did you end up where you are today? Um, so I'm, I went with Cedar Fort because I had heard about them several years previously. I'm a member of the League of Utah Writers now. Um, several years ago, back around 2000, 2001, I was not a member, but I did attend one of their meetings just to see what it was like. And there was a, repre a representative there from Cedar Fort. And they handed out some bookmarks and said, we like new authors, and so I remembered that. And this book, um, by the way, took nine years to write wasn't nine, nine years of continuous writing. I was also starting a family and going back to school and things like that. So off and on for nine years, and it really got rolling in the last couple of years, which was, um, oh, I want to say 20, 2015, 2016, I got writing harder. And as I was coming to the end of it, I got thinking, where could I send this? Well, I remembered that early meeting of the League of Utah Writers that I attended and Cedar Fort. And so I thought, well, I'll submit it to them. Well, actually, no, even before I did that, there was a previous book that my dad and I collaborated on, also World War II, um, from the American side. And I submitted that to Cedar Ford, actually, based on my memory of having met, met the representative at this meeting. Anyway, they rejected that book. They, did, they didn't just send me a form letter saying, um, you know, sorry, we can't use your book. They gave me some specific feedback, which I, first of all, took to heart and incorporated into The Road to Freedom. And also I remembered, well, they paid, they paid close attention to my book, even though they didn't end up going with it. So I liked that. And when it was time to submit The Road to Freedom, they were my first choice. What was that like after 
nine years of working on something to, you know, get that email back saying that they're going to publish your book? It was a thrill. Um, this, the, it had been my dream for most of my life to have a book published and to see it actually happen. It was, it was unreal. Did you have a panic attack like I did? <laughs> oh, <laughs> um, no, not a panic <laughs> oh, good attack. For you. I just, just sat there in shock for a minute. My my wife actually called and said, there, "There's an email for you. You better read it right now." And so I was on oh. the phone with her while I read it. And that was kind of fun to share that with her. So how long did it take before you heard back from them? It was pretty quick. It was just a matter of weeks, really. Mm-hmm. I think I submitted it in March of 2017 and heard back in April. Who's your target audience for this book? Um, adults and, well, I think, I think it ranges really from young adults to adults. There's something there for both groups. Mm-hmm. Just, just not necessarily in the uh, simplicity of the language necessarily, but the theme of the book really is if you do the right thing, then you will be rewarded mm-hmm. for it. And that happens in the case both of um, the captain who I mentioned. He's an adult. He's seen a lot. And his reward is not immediate, but you'll see how that um, how the choices he makes take him to a certain point in his life. Also, the private, he's a young man. He joins up in his late teens, and so that's something I think a lot of kids could identify with as he goes out into the world. He tries, he's the Latter-day Saint, so he tries to keep his standards up as he goes into this new and scary situation, and, and he's blessed for it. How did you decide how to handle that um, Latter-day Saint aspect. How did you know how a, a Latter-day Saint would handle war? That's something I've considered a lot is all these wars that we've had. And, you know, our our brothers and sisters, mostly brothers, fighting in them. What I, what I did was, well, I thought of two things. What would it be like if you as a Latter-day Saint were in the minority in a place where people were... Um, you know, or, who obviously had standards different from yours. And I've been there myself, not, not, in a, not in the military, obviously. I spent a year teaching English in Japan after college, and I was the only Latter-day Saint for miles. And all the other teachers who I worked with, you know, they, they drank. They liked, to, um, they liked to drink. They had coffee and tea, um, going out after hours, things like that, that I wasn't into. So I kind of thought a little bit about how I was... I had a different set of standards from the people around me and how I was mm-hmm. going to keep those up. So it, it wasn't so much so different to imagine a kid, you know, suddenly being surrounded by soldiers who didn't share his standards. He was going to stand out in much many of the same ways. There was a lot of um, drinking in the Army at that time. That was something I found in my research. They coped with the terror of that situation by being heavily medicated a lot of the time. Obviously not something he was going to do. And then the, the other thing I asked myself was, well, how would I feel being a young man going to war against a, an enemy as vicious as the Russians? I'd be terrified. And if you're terrified, who do you turn to for, um, for support? Well, if you know that the Lord guides you and that you have the Holy Ghost, you're going to try and um, develop a closer relationship with the Lord and ask him for help and protection as often as you can. Your story is aside from it being a war book, it's not super graphic, just so that the listeners understand. Um, I I would probably feel comfortable with like a 13-year-old reading it, I think. Right. I mean, there is a lot of death and, and killing and stuff, but you don't go into detail on the gore of it or anything like that. I want to talk about the the LDS in Germany at that time. You've done, in in researching this book, I'm sure you came across, you know, some LDS stories and stuff. How did they feel about what was going on in their country at that time. They had to have seen, you know, the concentration camps and these human rights violations going on, you know. Um, they did. And from what, I, from what I read, there was... Oh, that, that's, that's kind of a big answer, actually. Because, you know, one of the articles of faith that we have is to um, follow our local leaders. And some of them took that to heart in that they said, well, the Nazis are in charge, and so we need to follow them. And there were members of the church who were members who were members of the Nazi party as well. Other members of the church obviously did not like the Nazis. They could see what was going on, and they weren't on board with it. And I kind of I kind of leaned toward that side of things. But they wouldn't have had a choice, right? Right. I mean, if they got enlisted, they got enlisted. They would have had no choice. It would have ended up 
they would have ended up in a concentration camp as well, right? That's true. If they if they had um, resist if they had actively resisted the government, then that would have happened to them. And there is that um, the well known story of uh, Helmut Hubener and his friends who were members of the church in Germany, and they they led a resistance. They led a resistance against the Nazis. They would print up leaflets from things they heard on the BBC, and that got them in trouble. Uh, Helmut Hubener, Hubener was actually executed for that, and his oh, friends. Was he? Yeah, he I was put to that. death, and his friends were um, his friends were imprisoned until the end of the war. And the leader of their branch was a member of the Nazi Party, and so there was a lot of conflict. Their activities caused some conflict even in their branch of the church. But I um, I didn't want to get too deeply into that. The um, the LDS family that I focus on in this book, they, they don't like the Nazis. They don't dare actively resist if, if they have to um, go along to get along. They kind of do. But there is a moment in the book where um, my young private, while he's in high school, he gets an assignment, a math assignment. And it's all couched in a racial terms, like uh, how many... Oh, it, it was a it was it was an actual math question I found in my research, and it was something like if um, this many dismental, this many uh, mentally disabled people are costing the state this much money, how much would the state save by uh, putting them all to death? Something like that. And he reads this question and shows it to his parents and says, "What am I going to what am I what am I going to say?" And his parents say, "Well, just get it wrong. You know, don't answer questions like that. You can't argue with your teacher, but at the same time, just get it wrong." Wow. What was going on in Germany at the time that allowed something like this to come to pass, allowed the Nazis to come to power and for them to fall for this socialist party? Well, as I understand it, it, it all had its roots in World War I and how Germany lost World War I. Uh, many Germans weren't ready to give up at the end of World War mm. I. They were upset that their leaders were surrendering. Um, I think the man who signed the Versailles, the Treaty of Versailles was actually assassinated for doing that. Um, and there was chaos in Germany afterwards. The, there was the rising National Socialist Party. There was the Communist Party. A lot of, a lot of factions fighting for control of the, uh, of the country. And Hitler had, had, the, had the rare talent of um, tapping into people's fears. I mean, inflation was terrible. The economy was in the dumper. Um, just a lot of things going on. He unified everybody saying, we're going to make the country better. We're going to revive the economy. We're going to bring industry back. And most importantly, we are going to become warriors again. Because one thing they were not allowed to do under the Treaty of Versailles was to have an army and to have military build up. They had lands taken away from them as part of their reparations. He says, we're going to get our land back. We're going to have a, an army we can be proud of. You know, we're going to be you know, we're going to be Germany again. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people responded to that. The economy got better. There was industry. You know, at first it was what they, it was what they wanted to hear and what they needed. And then of course, Hitler being Hitler took it to the places that he did. And by then a lot of people, they had no choice. They were living in a dictatorship. Right. So are there any interesting stories about um, just the war in general or particularly um, LDS people at that time that you didn't incorporate into the book that you could share with us? Yeah, I, like I said, I took my my main frame of reference on um, being LDS in, in Nazi Germany from the story of uh, Helmut Hubener and his friends as resistance leaders. Obviously, this is not a story about the resistance, so I didn't use any of those exploits in my book. Um, another one is I actually had a couple of great uncles who served missions in Germany during the 30s, so while the Nazis were in power. And that, that has a place in my book. There are a couple of characters in my book doing that. What happened to one of my uncles was he was detained by the Gestapo for a week, and he never knew why, but he was arrested and he was held, and his mission president had to work to get him free, which um, has become a story in our family and is was, of course, a very harsh experience for him. That's not in my book. The story didn't call for it, but that was something that I've always found very interesting. Why Germany? Why this interest in Germany? You know, that's a good question. I don't really know why, but I have always had just a particular affinity for Germany. Um, I'm not German. I don't speak German. I don't know any German people. I've never been to Germany, but I love the food. Um, I would like to go to Germany someday. I love the food. I love the sound of the language. 
I like German rock bands. Just, <laughs> it, it's very strange. I don't know where it comes from, but I've always just been drawn to Germany in some way. And so writing about Germany, it, it was fun for me to do this from a German perspective and to just kind of put myself in that place for a while. So is uh, one of your favorite restaurants downtown then Siegfried's? Yes, been there many times. Yeah, we love Siegfried's. It's so good. Are there any other German restaurants around here? Not that I'm aware of. I think there is one on Main Street, and I can't remember the name of it. I think it's a little more high-end, and I've never been there. Hmm. Um, so we mostly mostly go to Siegfried's. I, I've tried cooking German food at home. A couple of Christmases ago, we had bratwurst and sauerkraut. Mm -hmm. Really liked that. So, uh, oh, oh, there is um, Bohemian Grill down in, down in Midvale on 72nd mm -hmm. South. We've had a few work lunches there, and I'm always happy when somebody picks that for lunch. That's German? It, it's Middle European, so oh, okay. I always get... Oh, so it's got some German stuff there. Yeah, they have, they have pierogies and they have pub food, but they have a really good sauerkraut and uh, bratwurst mm -hmm. plate that I always I get. I would have never thought that that one would have <laughs> Bohemian Girl, but just because of the name. I would have never thought that they would have anything like that there. Your your love for Germany goes beyond just the food and stuff. You also love like old German films you were telling me, and what else? Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, on the subject of German films, they, they had a really... They had a really rich tradition in film from the late teens, from about 1919, 1920. So just after the war up to when the Nazis came to power, there were a lot of good movies that um, came out of that era, a lot of good silent movies that were very innovative. And I've been watching those movies since I was young. And I actually kind of worked in some, some Easter eggs into the book that refer back to those movies as though they were part of the actual universe that the... Um, that the book is set in, not as movies, but as actual events. Um, just to give one example, there's a movie called M, which is about a serial killer, and it's kind of a police procedural movie. The head investigator's name is Loman, and one of the minor characters in my book is named Loman, and it's mentioned that his father is a homicide detective in Berlin. So just little callbacks to mm -hmm. movies that I like from Germany are scattered throughout the book. We have... Later today, actually, Robert Freeman is coming to do an interview, um, and he's written... Have you read these Saints at War books? He's got one about Germany, too. I've read the, I've, I've read the one... I think there's one about World War II. Mm-hmm. He's got World War I, World War II, um, just like a general one, inspiring stories, and then he's got the German one, too. I'll, I, I haven't gotten... In, I haven't... Um... I, was, I wasn't aware of most of those. I think my dad has the Saints at War based in World War II, and I've looked through that. Um, that's actually really interesting because something that I've wanted to try, I don't know if I will, is to uh, write a, an LDS-themed story taking place in each of the wars of the 20th century. I did World War II, obviously. I'm working on one now that, I'm working on one now that involves Vietnam. I don't know if I will ever get get a good idea for World War One or for the Korean War, but that's a that's a project I've been kicking around just to mm -hmm. do one for each war. Maybe, maybe not. So, what going back to your uncle again? What happened to the missionaries once the war started? Did the do you know? Did the church just decide to pull them out, or they did? I'm not sure what what year it was. If it was in 1939 when the war started, or soon before. But yeah, all the missionaries were pulled out of Europe, and the local leaders were kind of left to their own devices. They didn't have a lot of contact with the church or with church headquarters. And something that I've heard is that. In the absence of that oversight from church headquarters, a lot of the local leaders gradually started drifting back to um, practices that they had they had done in, if they had been members of a previous church before being baptized into ours. So that by the time that by the time missionaries came back to Europe after the war, they were finding um, branches of the church where they were lighting candles to say prayers and had had local had branch leaders wearing robes to preach. Things mm -hmm. that called back more maybe to Lutheran practices or Catholic practices. I don't know a lot of details just on that. Just after four years? Yeah. Um, just, yeah, I guess so. That's that's something that I came across in my research. That's very interesting. I guess um, maybe some of that was they were trying not to stand out so much, you know. And that's possible, too. I have heard that um, the Gestapo would come and sit in on LDS meetings. Mm. And I've heard different things, too, either... Um, I've heard that the Nazis liked the Mormons because they 
they had that article of faith where they where they said, um, you know, we believe in being subject to our kings, our, really, our kings. Yeah. exactly, and and that made them good citizens of the state. But I've also heard, I've also heard, and I can't remember where I heard this. Somebody saying, you know, after after we take care of the Jews, you Mormons are next. Somebody saying that to a member of the church, and I don't know if that was an isolated thing or if that was the prevailing attitude, because the Nazis not only targeted Jews, they also targeted Jehovah's Witnesses and mm-hmm. members of other um, smaller religions. So may, maybe maybe their view of the Latter Day Saints varied from uh, place to place within yeah, the country. Maybe. Gosh, that would be so scary. Can you imagine living through a time like that? Oh, it would be terrifying. I remember, I don't know if you've ever seen the movie Escape from Sobibor. Mm-mm. This was a TV movie that came out in 1987, and it is about um, one of the Nazi death camps that they set up in Poland strictly for the liquidation of the Jews. It was on the um, far eastern border of Poland, and it was a very small, isolated place where they they immediately gas 90% of the people that they um, took there. And anyway, the uh, remaining, the uh, the Jews that they kept there to work, they rose up and they they rebelled and they escaped. And it's, it's a great movie and a very fascinating story. I watched that and I was about 12 years old and it scared me to death because it got me thinking, well, it happened to them. Could that ever happen to us? Could that ever happen to another church? I was genuinely concerned about that for a while. Mm-hmm. And, and this, you know, from a kid in the middle of the United States. Right. And that brings me to uh, my next question is, you know, how do you feel like what's going on in our country now? There have been people saying, you know, that certain political leaders are Hitler, you know, and saying things like that. And I've heard on both sides, not just our current president, but before people were saying that as well, when it was the other party, uh, you know, how do you how do you feel about that? <clears throat> oh well, I definitely think that we should we should love each other. That is the first thing that everybody should do, regardless of your political affiliation, regardless of your feelings on anything. Basically, just look at other people as brothers and sisters. I think there are too many lines that are being drawn mm-hmm. in the sand, and people, you have to be on this side or that side, or we, or, or you know, we we can't be friends. We can't like each other. We have to hate each other. And I don't like that at all. I. I was talking with my wife. So my, my wife is from Mexico, and she's um, moved here from Mexico. And so, you know, I spend a lot of time with uh, Hispanic culture and have gotten to know it pretty well, and I like it. She was talking to me once about something that bothered her, and she says to me, doesn't that bother you? And I said, you know, I'm a, I'm a, straight, white, you know, I'm a straight white American male. Nothing affects me. And I got thinking about that, and I thought, well, that's true, but that means that kind of my, my job is not to be a reactionary, but to, um, to seek understanding, mm-hmm. like it says in the scriptures, to seek understanding of other people's points of view. And there are so many different points of view now that I, I really think that um, everybody should try to seek understanding, try to understand how other people feel about things and not just say, well, I'm right and you're wrong. And you have to think the way I do, otherwise Mm -hmm. we're going to have a problem. Yeah, I really don't like it when people um, paint everybody with the same broad brush, for one. I'm probably using that analogy so wrongly, but you know what I mean. Yeah. You know, I just, I don't like it when people do that. You can't assume that just because somebody is from a certain area or looks a certain way, that they are going to be a certain way in in any way at all. Um, I think that people who think that way are much closer to being Hitler, you know, <laughs> than the some of the political leaders we've had recently. But um, I think, and I also feel like the media conflates everything, don't you think? Like, I feel like they're reporting things that I don't see on a daily basis, like in reality, you know, and not, at least not in, we're kind of in like middle America, though. But maybe that that is what's going on in the cities, but it's not going on here. Right. And uh, one thing that I've one thing that I've noticed too, the media likes to inflame things because mm-hmm. now in our digital age, everything is fueled by clicks. Right. They want your clicks. They want your eyes on their article, mainly because of the advertisers. And so they will come up with the uh, the most inflammatory headline that they can to get you to click on it and get to get you angry. 
Um, Because it's always about money first. Yes, exactly. I think if more people understood that, you just always follow the money. And that's always the number one thing that's important to them. If If I'm looking at a news site like Yahoo and it's got something inflammatory about Muslims because they know that people will go down in the comments and argue with each other Mm -hmm. about it. Then I start thinking, oh, the state of Muslim-American relations is so horrible. I'll I'll get thinking about that. I develop what's called mean world syndrome where I start thinking the world is a worse Mm -hmm. place than it really is. Um, I've I've only ever met a couple of Muslims in my life. One of them, one of them, was a guy who worked in the in our apartment building, and he was the nicest, kindest, most humble guy you you could ever meet. So when I, when I hear all the, you know when I hear about oh, you know Muslim problems and rhetoric against Muslims, I think of him, and I say to myself, there there's a reason why the media is trying to get everybody stirred up about the Muslim question or LGBT issues or. Um, politics or anything else. It's because they want people to get riled up and argue. You see that in the Book of Mormon, you know. Mm -hmm. Zeezrom's whole, you know, he was the lawyer whose whole living was getting people angry at each other so that he could step in and resolve their disputes and get paid for it. I think they want to keep people scared too, which is actually a Nazi tactic. They want to keep people scared because when people are scared, you can control them easier. Absolutely, yeah. Which is really scary. That I don't watch the news anymore. <laughs> I shouldn't. When I need a brain break at work, sometimes I'll jump onto a, a news site and see what the headlines are, of the day are and usually regret it. Yeah. Yeah, I, there's just, I mean, besides that thing that everybody says, there's nothing uplifting on the news. I, they're also not reporting things accurately like we were just saying about about that kind of stuff. The first time I realized that the news was completely out of control was when I was probably like 19 years old. And it was when Elizabeth Smart was um, found at that Walmart on Redwood Road. And they just started attacking the story. Every news, local news station attacking the story, just saying angles and things that were just completely untrue. They were all saying different things because none of them had the full story yet. Oh, yeah. So they were just saying things just to get the story out there first. And it took us like a couple days to a week to figure out the actual story of like how she was found and what the police did and everything. And that's when I like first woke up to that the news is – is ridiculous <laughs> you it know is. That the media is ridiculous and you can't just believe everything they say because uh they're they're just trying to get the story out there for the money you know and it's worse now because now it's all clickbait stuff yeah exactly and um, people don't even <clears throat> click and read the news they just see the headline and and just take that as that's the news <laughs> just the headline you know yeah twitter news well, I think digital innovations have, have made a lot of things really um, convenient, mm-hmm. and it's it's good for um, you know spreading the gospel and a lot of other things. But with with everything, there is a downside to it, and yeah. I think it's like what we've been saying. Yeah, and I've noticed if you want to get to like the source of a news story, um, for whatever reason, one of these news media outlets will uh, become the most viewed on that particular story. But then if you really look into it, they source another media outlet. And that one has sourced another one. And that one has sourced another one. So none of them are actually getting the news from the source, you know. They're just repeating, they're regurgitating what the other news outlets have said and stuff. And it's really, really hard to get to the bottom of uh, what's really going on in the world. True. (laughs) So... I've almost given up, almost. But um, with that said, what do you think that we should be learning from from all these wars? What are what should we be taking away from these that you think our generation is not from the from the wars that have that mm-hmm. have already come? All the ones that you've researched and looked into. Well, sometimes there's a reason for going to war, and sometimes there's not. I. I really think that um, there there was a lot of justification for World War II. Obviously, we had to stop Hitler. We had to stop Japan. Since then, you know, I've looked into well, the, and the Korean War was was much the same. That was an act of aggression that we had to answer. And South Korea is definitely better for it. 
After that, it, it's kind of hit and miss. I mean, Vietnam, obviously, huge fiasco. The first Gulf War, again, answering an act of aggression. The second Gulf War, another fiasco. Um, so you just need to... Um, well, well, again, I refer back to the Book of Mormon when, when I try to understand things like this. You remember, whenever the Nephites were defending themselves, they had the Lord on their side. Whenever they got too proud of themselves and boasted in their own strength, as it says in the scriptures, and got aggressive, mm -hmm. they, usually, they usually lost. They were usually brought down into the dust. And so it's, it, it's that idea of, um, are we doing this for the right reasons? And I think we've seen more restraint lately, the, the war with the war with ISIS that took place a few years ago, we didn't have American boots on the ground. We didn't rush over there and try and take care of it all ourselves. We, we let it be handled locally. And we, I, I imagine we funded it behind the scenes and, and helped out in other supportive ways. But uh, that was a more judicious application of, of the might that we could bring to bear. Let's talk about Veterans Day, because I was hoping that we could air this on Veterans Day. Um, how... How has researching these wars and, and learning about this changed your perspective on veterans in this country? I thought a lot about it, um, the sacrifice that it is for any young man to put his life on hold to go to war. Um, some, some people volunteer for the military. They're made for the military, and that's wonderful. I have, I have nothing but respect for, um, for the, you know, our, our people in the service in the U.S. military. I think it's wonderful what they're doing. Uh, and, and other times, people have been called up. My grandfathers were drafted into World War II. Um, one of my dad's cousins joined, joined the military in Vietnam, and he was killed in Vietnam. So he made the ultimate sacrifice for his country. But I've thought a lot about what would it be like to um, have to go to war and to do a job that is not only dangerous but, but ugly and distasteful and just very harsh. And so many men have done that, so many men and women have done that over the years that um, they absolutely deserve to be remembered on Veterans Day and Memorial Day. Um, that's something that's always very close to my mind when I, um, you know, when those dates come around, I think of the sacrifice they made. Yeah. I mean, regardless of if you agree with the reasons for these wars or not, you can't deny the sacrifice that those people made, you know, for for our freedom to keep us free and, and to, I feel like the military gets a bad rap sometimes because people don't agree with the reasons why we're at war and they blame the soldiers, you know, when it's not really the soldiers, it's our political leaders who are, you know, in control of what reasons we go to war, you know, it makes me so sad to see people disrespect soldiers because of that. Uh, as I mentioned, so I'm working on I'm working on a book right now that takes place during Vietnam, and Vietnam is really the uh, big example of of what you said. People yeah. going to war for the wrong reasons and it causing just so much turmoil in America as people realize that this was a war we should not have been involved in, and taking it out on the wrong people, taking it out on the soldiers. Um, Vietnam was one of the wars that had a draft, wasn't it? Yes, and. The thought, the thought of having to live under the shadow of that draft also terrifies me. Mm -hmm. um, my dad, he didn't serve a mission because he had to stay home and be eligible for the draft. And he didn't get drafted, but, you know, luckily for him, he didn't get drafted. But he would have gone had he been drafted. And like I said, his cousin did go and was killed. And the way that people, and I think that people look back on that now and realize that it was all handled so poorly the way that we... Um, Blame the soldiers for the whole fiasco of Vietnam. Right. We don't do that anymore, obviously. You, you see a, a shift. I, I remember seeing a shift quite in the other direction in the first Gulf War in 91, where people were always supporting the troops. Mm -hmm. And I was young, and I took part in that too, supporting the troops and, and putting up the yellow ribbons and the American flags and things like that. And, I'm, and, I'm, and I would say that that attitude has really prevailed ever since then, and I'm, and I'm glad that it has. I saw a little bit of it still remaining around 9-11 um, in Iraq. I do remember hearing some stories about some people protesting outside of military bases and throwing rocks and that sort of thing. 
Um, but definitely not as much as probably Vietnam. Of course, I wasn't there. No. But I've heard stories. Not from what I've read, no. Yeah, I, that's just... Uh, I hope that doesn't happen anymore. I feel like I feel like you're right. We have come to terms with understanding that it's not these soldiers that um, are controlling these wars, and it's not their fault. And and some of them are. Uh, there's a lot of them that g- join the military to go to college, and then a war hits, you know, and then they end up being deployed, you know. And I'm I'm sure in the '90s and stuff. Uh, a lot of people didn't think they would ever have to go to war if yeah. they were in the army because we hadn't had one for so long. Yeah. Um, a friend of mine, his his older brother was in the Marine Corps at that time, and he didn't, he, he didn't end up getting deployed, but the possibility existed, and they were worried about it. But, um, yeah, yeah, that could have happened for him. Well, even my brother-in-law, he is a dentist in the army. Um, even he had to be deployed oh, really? for almost a year. Yeah, wow. just being a dentist. He and he spent. He was supposed to spend a year in Iraq, uh, but somebody above him pulled some strings, and he only ended up staying, I think, for like eight months. But uh, can you imagine joining the army to become a dentist, and then thinking, "I'll never have to go to war," <laughs> you know? I'm a dentist, and yeah, he did end up going, and it was really, really hard on the family. And but we appreciate him <laughs> a lot. Yeah. And their sacrifice that he's still in the army actually too, but I don't think he has to be deployed again. Hopefully not. Right. But um well, let's talk about you talked a, you touched a little bit on your next book. So that's kind of what you're working on now. How close are you to getting that published? Um still working on the first draft. This was actually something I had written a good hundred pages of it last year and then realized it wasn't going in the direction that I wanted it to. So I took some time off from that and just have been revisiting it recently. I restructured it. I'm using some of, I did a lot of research into the Vietnam War to write the first bit that I wrote and Mm -hmm. I'm not going to be able to use it all now with the restructuring that I have planned, which is kind of a bummer, but that's okay. That's the way it goes. It was still really interesting. Got a lot out of it. Um, So I'm still working on the on the first draft of that and it's going through my critique group with the league of utah writers which has a we we trade critiques every two weeks and there's a cap of 3200 words per critique session so if i run the whole book through them it's going to take a really long time Mm -hmm. we'll see what happens with that but as far as actually completing that first draft i'm inching toward the finish line i don't have a lot of time to write i you know, work full time and engage in parenthood in the evenings. So after I get the <laughs> engage in parenthood, yeah, um, getting home from work. As long as the kids are up, my time is for them. Yeah, and and you know, for my wife, for the family. Once the kids are in bed, then I have some time to write in the evenings. My batteries are usually pretty low by yeah. that time of the day, but I do the best I can. Oh yeah, I feel you, and I I think all the rest of us authors here uh, are. It's the same, you know, it's really hard. And then when you have to do revisions and stuff, that's totally different than just sitting there and and writing too, isn't it? Yeah. Like, uh, that takes a ton of work. And you have, you're revising the whole thing or just like sections of it? Just sections of it. I'm, well, the, the part that I wrote is all about the main character joining the army, going to Vietnam and his experiences there. And that wasn't working for an actual for the actual narrative. So I set all that aside. Mm-hmm. I brought the narrative up to when he's an adult and how the war has affected him as an adult, how it's affected him and his family. And then there are um, callbacks to what happened to him in Vietnam that illustrate why it's affecting him in this way now. So when I use the callbacks, the flashbacks, I can use what I wrote before. Mm-hmm. But I'm having to rewrite all of his adult life or rather come up with that now. Mm-hmm. So I'm writing that stuff fresh and then pulling in the stuff that I'd written before as I need it. What kind of writer are you? Are you a big plotter or do you kind of just sit and write and just let it flow out? A little of both. I like to, usually when I have a story in mind, I will know how it begins. There are points along the way that I know I want to hit. Mm-hmm. And I usually will know how it ends, more or less. So sometimes when there's a lot of space between those points, I don't know what's going to fill them, what's going to fill in the uh, 
the narrative in between them. And that's where I do a little bit more of um, pantsing, as they refer to, Mm -hmm. you know, riding by the seat of your pants. And sometimes you discover things during those moments that affect the whole narrative of the book. And I really like those moments of discovery. It's it's really fun to just have that burst of inspiration. Yeah. Yeah, I th- I think that's how um, a lot of authors are. That I also tend to layer my stories. So I start out with my first draft, and then the second draft I add in a bit more detail and and that sort of thing. And then my gaps too because sometimes I just skip over those gaps I'm like I don't know what to put here maybe I'll figure it out when I come back and (laughs) yeah do the next you know the next part the next layering but a lot of those a lot of those things come to me when I'm not writing when Mm -hmm. my brain's not engaged because I'm washing the dishes or I'm out for a run or something of course I can't take notes during those times I try to remember the things that come to me and usually I do I, I figure if it's important I'll remember it yeah, one time I plotted an entire novel while I was taking a walk, and I just did it like voice to text on my phone. Oh wow, that's <laughs> the a good idea. The entire thing. <laughs> I was really, really inspired that day. <laughs> All right, so where can everybody find you on social media? Right now, I have a Facebook page. I just updated, so I have my regular Facebook profile, and then an author page attached to that, which was called The Road to Freedom until recently. I just had the name changed to author Sean Pollock because obviously I want to be more than just one book. Mm -hmm. So yeah, mostly Facebook at the moment. I should have a website up. I don't know when exactly we're working on that. But when I do, of course, I'll use social media to get that word out. All right. And before I let you go, is there anything you want to say in closing? Did we hit everything that you wanted to talk about? I think so. As I look back, I think we talked about everything that we did, and I can't think of anything new right now. In that case, thank you for joining me today. Thank you. I enjoyed it.